I go into these companies and I analyze the performance of groups of people, right? And there's in those groups there are people who are really striving, really trying hard and working themselves really hard and being productive. And then there's these people that are just doing nothing. They're completely in the way. They don't carry their weight at all. They take advantage every chance they get. And they're always whining about why they can't work. It's like, I find out who they are, I call them into my office, and I tell them exactly what they've been doing. It's like, hit the road, buddy. You've had your, you've had your run of it. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, fair enough. You know, well, I, I can tell you, you know, I, I've had situations in my lab where I had underperforming graduate students. And one of the things that was really awful about that was that it was really hard on the high-performing graduate students. You know, because they felt that even being in the same category as the people who weren't working hard and pulling their weight devalued what they were doing. You know, and that's exactly right. And so this is also why there's, there's a conscientiousness trait and an agreeableness trait. Because conscientious people judge you on your accomplishments, right? They don't give a damn about your feelings, not a bit. It's like, are you doing the work or not? Whereas agreeable people think, well, you know, your mother's sick and, you know, you've, you've got a bunch of family problems and, and we all have to take care of each other and it's no wonder that you're having a rough time. And, like, you can't say that one of those attitudes is correct and the other isn't correct. You can't say that. There wouldn't be those two dimensions if there wasn't something correct about both of them. But you can certainly point out that often they conflict, you know, and so the demand for, for inclusiveness and unity and care and the demand for high-level performance in a hierarchical structure. There are very different orientations in the world. And so, it's complicated for people who are agreeable and conscientious. And if you want to hire someone to exploit productively, you hire middle-aged women who are hyper-conscientious and who are agreeable. Because they'll do everything. They won't take credit for it and they won't complain. And that's nasty. And I think that happens all the time. And so one of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is not to be exploited. Because you'll line up to be exploited. And I think the reason for that is because you're wired to be exploited by infants. And so, that just doesn't work so well in that actual world. And one of the things, one of the things that happens very often in psychotherapy, you know, people come to psychotherapy for multiple reasons, but one of them is they often come because they're too agreeable. And so what they get is so-called assertiveness training, although it's not exactly assertiveness that's being trained. What it is is the ability to learn how to negotiate on your own behalf. And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh. And they probably are nasty and harsh, but they're also probably true. And you need to bring those up to the forefront and deliver the message. And it's not straightforward at all because agreeable people do not like conflict. Not at all. They smooth the water. You know, and you can see, you can see why that is in accordance with the hypothesis that I've been putting forward. You don't want conflict around infants. It's too damn dangerous. You don't want fights to break out. You don't want anything to disturb the, the relative peace. You know, and if you're also more prone to being hurt physically, and perhaps emotionally, you also may be loath to engage in the kind of high intensity conflict that will solve problems in the short term. Because a lot of conflict, it takes a lot of conflict to solve problems in the short term. And you know, if that can spiral up to where it's dangerous, which it can if it gets uncontrolled, it might be safer in the short term to keep the waters smooth and to not delve into those situations where conflict emerges. The problem with that is it's not a very good medium to long-term strategy, right? Because lots, lots of times there are things you have to talk about because they're not going to go away. And so partly what you do with agreeable people is you get them to figure out, and they have a hard time with this too. If you ask a disagreeable person what, what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want and this is how I'm going to get it. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want. Because they're so accustomed to living for other people and to finding out what other people want and to trying to make them comfortable and so forth that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own desires as they move through life. And that's not... Look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to uh, forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. It's something like those that have more get more and those that have less get less. That's the Matthew principle, right? To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken away. 
the economists sometimes call that the Matthew principle. And so what, what that lays out is a w world that's rife with inequality. So you know, you, you hear this idea that I think it's the 85 richest people in the world have more money than the bottom two billion. That's a Pareto distribution phenomena. And you might say, uh, to hell with capitalism for producing that. It's like, sorry, you got your diagnosis wrong. It's a natural law. It's no, no matter what society you study, you get a Pareto distribution of wealth. You get a Pareto distribution of number of records recorded. You get a Pareto distribution of number of songs written or goals scored. Like any creative product has that characteristic. And it's partly because as you start to become successful, let's say, people offer you more and more opportunities. And as you start to fail, people move away from you and you plummet. And so, okay, so that's rough. So what it, is, what it means is that there is always a landscape of inequality. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do anything about it, although I am saying that we don't know what to do about it. That's the thing, you know, because you can modify the Pareto distribution of wealth, let's say, but if you, but we don't know how to do it without maybe disrupting the system so completely that it collapses, which is what happened in the Soviet Union, for example, and, and in Maoist China. They were trying, at least in principle, to adjust inequality. But the cure was far worse than the disease. And the, the truth of the matter is, we actually don't know technically how much inequality there has to be to generate wealth. We can guess, and you could say, well, there should be less, and you might say, well, there should be more. If you're left-wing, you'd say less, and if, if you're right-wing, you'd say, well, we'll just let the inequality flourish. But we do know that it's inevitable, and we also know that we don't know how to regulate it. So, there is inequality. What that means is there's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And, the, and that's, a, that's a problem because you can get jealous and you can get bitter and you can get resentful. And worse, you can get hopeless, you know, because you look like this friend of mine. He told me something so funny. Um, he, was, he was decrying his, his lack of success in the world. And he compared himself to his roommate. And uh, he said, you know, his roommate, his college roommate was doing much better than he was. And his bloody roommate was Elon Musk. It's like, it's like oh, you're not doing as well as Elon Musk. Well, it's, I mean, you can see, it would take it rather personally, because they were roommates and everything. It wasn't like he was doing badly, like he was doing pretty damn well. It's like, I'm not as good as Elon Musk. It's like, yeah, well, you and like seven billion other people, you know. But, but I thought it was instructive because, well, because you have to be careful who you compare yourself to. Now, you can't just not compare yourself to others, to successful people, right? Because then you don't have anything to aim at. And one of the things I learned from Jung, this was a cool thing, I'm going to make a real lateral move here. Jung thought the book of Revelation was appended to the Bible because the Christ in the Gospels was too merciful. He was too nice a guy. Now, he's an ideal, right? And Jung said, wait a second, an ideal is always a judge. That's the thing about an ideal because you're not as good as your ideal, so your ideal is a judge. And Revelation has Christ coming back as a judge. And that was Jung's explanation at the level of the collective unconscious for the pasting of that remarkably strange and terrible book onto the end of the, of the, of the, of the Bible. So, well, anyways, my point is, is an ideal is it, you need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge, and you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient. So I was trying to work that out in the chapter, and this is something I've had to work out a lot as a clinical psychologist. It's like, well, let's say you need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal, and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it, and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, it's, it's, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is, and then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal difficult but proximal.